Hello, and welcome to Ceramic Storytime with Sue. I am just going to give you a couple moments to come in and join me live, and I'll just make sure that everything's working the way that it's supposed to. <clears throat> um, so happy new year, 2021. Uh, looking forward to this year. I have lots of big plans for um, glaze courses. I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna create an online course about how to mix glazes from scratch. Um, so that's my first major project of this year. And then I'm also working on um, a bigger course on glaze chemistry and glaze formulation, um, the unity molecular formula, all that sort of fun stuff. So um, exciting news, but I wanted to start off the new year with um, reading my blog post, uh, start mixing your own ceramic glazes, a shopping list in case uh, one of your goals this year is to start mixing glazes from scratch. Um, so um, I'm just gonna, I don't see that I'm live yet. Um, so I'm just going to confirm that, uh, that this is working. Oh, okay. I see myself. So if you're here with me live, um, please feel free to make comments, um, ask me questions in the chat, and then I will answer them for you. Um, I had a couple questions, um, posted earlier, so I'll answer those. And, um, yeah, just, uh, I'm happy to, uh, chat and interact with you during this. Um, and then this is being recorded and then this video will be posted to this, the blog post that I'm going to read. Um, so it'll be available to watch the replay and um, <clears throat> and you can, uh, you can get the information that way. So please say hello if you're here live, let me know that you um, are here and that you can see and hear me. Um, and if you want to follow along, um, you can go to bit.ly forward slash glaze shopping list, all one word. And I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, so there we go. So now this is my blog post. So if you go to bit.ly, it's scrolling across the bottom of the screen bit.ly forward slash glaze shopping list. That'll bring you to this blog post here. Um, and you can follow along. So I'm going to get started now reading this post. Um, so it's called Start Mixing Your Own Ceramic Glazes, a Shopping List. <clears throat> um, if you wanna download this blog post as a PDF, you can do that on this page. You can just click this button and then enter your name and email address, and then you can keep this uh, for your files. And so if, if the shopping list is helpful to you, then you can download that and then have that with you while you're ordering your uh, glaze materials. So here we go. Um, are you ready to start mixing your own glazes? Do you want to increase your understanding of how glazes work? Have a little more control over your results? Maybe you've been using commercial pre-mixed glazes for a while now and they aren't exactly doing what you want them to. Perhaps you've reached the point in your ceramics journey that you want to start understanding the materials you're working with and what is actually happening when you put your pottery in the kiln. Or it could be that the cost of commercial glaze is adding up and you would like to explore a much cheaper option. What's the solution to these problems? Make your own glazes. I'm here to tell you the basic benefits of mixing your own glazes and a list of materials to get you started. So the benefits of mixing your own glazes. Control and understanding. When you mix your own glazes, you get to know your materials so that you can adjust your recipes in order to the, um, in order to achieve the results you're after. Is your glaze too glossy, not the right shade of blue? Knowing your materials and how they interact with each other gives you the freedom to make adjustments and fine tune your glazes to be exactly how you want them. Cost. 
At my local pottery supplier, a pint of pre-mixed glaze averages $15 to $30. Canadian, I'm in Canada. Um, a pint is the common size that glazes come in around here. The only gallon size uh, the only gallon size of commercial glaze that they carry is a clear glaze for $100. So that's $100 for a gallon of glaze. And I'd still have to mix my own colorants in. So for all the metric folks like me, a gallon is the equivalent of 3.8 liters. You can mix a gallon of glaze from scratch for under $5. Seriously. So um, if you are looking to start mixing your own glazes, um, I've created a shopping list uh, of materials that you can buy. So I've put together a list of the most common glaze materials and equipment necessary to start mixing your own glazes. With this list, you will have all the ingredients you need to make a very large variety of glaze recipes. Then as you figure out glazes, you specifically want to make, you can add to your inventory. You don't need all of these ingredients to make one glaze. You could get by with even less, but this list will give you the widest variety of possible glazes with the smallest number of materials. I work at Cone 6 and my material choices are based on common Cone 6 glaze recipes. I tried to keep the cost down and I chose the smaller um, I chose the smallest quantity that I would buy if I was just getting started. The quantities are according to what is available at my supplier. Your supplier might sell different quantities. For example, five kilograms of dolomite is the smallest, uh, the smallest bag that I could buy, which is a lot of dolomite if you're just getting started. So again, I'm in Canada. Um, I got a couple comments from people that are in Europe. Um, that the material choices are different and the prices are different. And so, yeah, this is based on where I buy my glaze materials and the prices and um, the materials that are available to me here in Canada. So if you're um, somewhere else in the world um, and you can't access some of these materials or if, you, um, if they're much more expensive, there might be a cheaper or more available option. Um, so if you can post in the Facebook group um, understanding glazes with Sue. Um, if you're watching live, that's the group you're in right now. So if you, um, if you're looking for suggestions for alternative materials, um, just post in the group because there's lots of people, there's over 7,000 people in the group from all over the world. And so I don't really know what the best alternatives are, like say, if you live in Germany or um, in the UK. Um, so the best, way to would be to post in the group and ask for suggestions. So here's my list of um, base ingredients. So the base ingredients, basically the way I think about a glaze recipe is you have your base recipe um, and then you have your additives, colorants, opacifiers, that sort of thing. So I've broken this list down. Um, so the base ingredients are the ingredients that just um, make up the base of a glaze recipe um, and don't really contribute to the color so much. So we've got silica, um, <clears throat> silica EPK. So silica is our main glass former um, in our glazes. EPK is Edgar plastic kaolin. So um, that's a clay. Um, clay is what keeps our glazes suspended in the bucket. Um, so any type of kaolin would do. Um, EPK is a brand name, Edgar plastic kaolin. So that's the brand of kaolin that um, I have access to here. Um, Grawleg is another type of kaolin. Um, <clears throat> so there are other um, there are other brands and names for things if you live in other parts of the world. Uh, frit 3124, so that's a ferro frit uh, that's quite common around here. Gersley borate, um, so there's another material called Gillespie borate um, that's similar, and I believe that that is uh, more available in Europe, possibly. Um, someone can let me know if that's correct. Um, or Ulexite is one of the um, Colmanite and Ulexite are kind of the two ingredients that make up 
grossly borate, but it's a naturally occurring material um, in California. So, um, so there's there's other materials that are very similar, but uh, we add grossly borate to a glaze recipe for its boron content. So fritz also are a good source of boron, um, but fritz and grossly borate, um, they can uh, both add boron to a glaze, but they kind of work differently. And so fritz are manufactured, whereas grossly borate is a naturally occurring material. And so they kind of behave a little bit differently in our glazes. Uh, Nepheline cyanide. So that is a material that is mined in Ontario, Canada. Um, and it's very cheap. It's a, a source of sodium and potassium. Um, so it, that is a um, a material that's used for its fluxes. Uh, Custer feldspar. So feldspar, um, so there's Custer feldspar, which is a potassium feldspar. Um, and then nephsi is kind of like a feldspar. It has um, fluxes, silica, and alumina. Um, Custer feldspar contains potassium, silica, and alumina. Um, and then a soda feldspar would contain sodium, silica, and alumina. Um, but nephsi is like a feldspar, but it has more flux um, proportionately uh, to glass former. So when you use a feldspar, you have a little bit more glass former, a little bit less flux. And when you have nephsi, you have a little bit more flux, a little bit less glass former. So it's a um, nephsi is a good way to get more flux into your glaze without adding a bunch of extra silica and alumina. Um, so that's glaze chemistry stuff that um, uh, if you stick with me, uh, we will get into uh, at a later date. Um, whiting, which is calcium carbonate. Um, so it might not be called whiting where you come from. Um, so that's one of our uh, alkaline earth fluxes. Calcium is, um, is an alkaline earth flux, whereas uh, sodium and potassium are alkaline metal fluxes. Um, so they, they kind of perform different roles in melt, the melting of our glazes. So we've got whiting for calcium, talc, which is a magnesium silicate, um, and then dolomite, which is a combination of calcium and magnesium. So calcium and magnesium are both um, alkaline earth fluxes. So those are the secondary fluxes in a glaze recipe. And then also zinc oxide, which is another secondary flux. So these are the base ingredients. By no means um, is this, are these all the ingredients? These are just the most common ingredients that I find in the glaze recipes that I've been making um, and uh, that are available to me here in Canada. Uh, Ricky Grimes says, yes, Gillespie borate is available in the UK. So yeah, so if you're um, in the UK, Gillespie borate is a substitute for Grisley borate. And they probably have different um, compositions, like a different chemical analysis slightly. Um, but basically the main ingredient that we are using these for is the boron content that they contain. Um, question, is EPK similar to Albany slip? That's from Jim Larkin. Um, so Albany slip, um, not quite. Albany slip is is a clay. Um, it's quite high in iron content. Um, so the thing about EPK is that it's quite pure. It does have a bit of iron and titanium contaminants. Um, so um, I wouldn't use Albany slip necessarily as a substitute for EPK. Um, I would try to find um, a different source of kaolin. Um, like, or even ball clay. Um, so there's Grolig, there's ball clay, um, EPK. So just like a more pure source of kaolin so that you're not adding in a bunch of iron contaminants. Um, although Albany slip can be used to make glazes um, and there are certain glazes that use it. There's also Alberta slip, um, 
Raven's Crag slip. Those are different um, naturally occurring clays that can be used to make glazes, but they um, they all contain quite a bit of iron. So you wouldn't want to use them in a clear glaze, for example. Um, it might have a yellowish tinge. So I know we had a clear glaze recipe that used Raven's Crag slip, which is a material that's mined in Alberta, Canada. Um, and it just had this yellowish tinge and that was from the, uh, the iron contaminants in the Raven's Craig slip. Um, okay, so I'll just get through this list here. So additives, bentonite. So I'm calling bentonite an additive because um, I, I keep it separately for, separate from the base recipe. So I will have my base recipe add up to 100%. And then bentonite, what I usually have um, one or 2% bentonite in a glaze if the glaze doesn't contain uh, very much clay in it. So clay is the material that keeps all the other materials suspended in the bucket so you can mix them around. Um, and so I like to keep bentonite um, separate from the base recipe so that I can um, just adjust. So say I have a glaze that has 1% bentonite and it's having trouble staying suspended. So if it's hard panning, I might increase that to 2%, um, but the base recipe would just stay the same. So we got bentonite and then copper carbonate and red iron oxide for colorants. Now these are the two cheapest colorants and I was trying to make a list that was like, you know, on a budget. Um, of course, we're missing cobalt, uh, which makes blue glazes. And cobalt is uh, a lot more expensive than copper and red iron oxide. But um, if I was just starting out, I would probably get a little bit of cobalt as well. The good thing about cobalt is it's very powerful. So even though it's really expensive, um, you usually only need a very small percentage, like 1% uh, in a glaze recipe is, gonna, is going to give you a lot of blue color. Um, blue, blues to purples, depending on the base recipe. So in Canada, where I live, uh, the total for all of these uh, materials would come to 125 Canadian dollars. Um, so that's like, if we're comparing that to the gallon of glaze that I mentioned earlier that was available to me for $100, um, this is a lot of materials like, um, yeah, like kilos and kilos, buckets and buckets of glaze can be made with just this small amount of glaze materials. Uh, oh, so with these materials, you can make buckets and buckets of glazes of different colors and textures. Feel free to add any other ingredients you find in your favorite recipes like colorants. Cobalt didn't make the cut. Um, so the other thing, so you can take this list um, and just like give it to your ceramic supplier and tell them that these are all the materials that you want. Um, if you're just starting out and you're not sure which glazes you wanna make, this is gonna give you a good base of ingredients. Um, but another thing that I would suggest is maybe to go find some glaze recipes that you want to make and just see what the materials are in them. And if there are any materials in those recipes that are not on this list, then you might want to buy those as well. Um, so other useful items. Oh, let me just check the comments here. Um, Okay, Lynn asks, how long do you recommend storing these ingredients? Um, I store them forever until they get used. So these are um, these materials are mined from the earth. Um, so they are, you know, millions of years old, <laughs> technically. Um, so yeah, as long as they're stored in, in an airtight container so that moisture can't get in. Um, and even if moisture does get in, it doesn't really ruin the material, but um, it can cause problems with clumping where um, the materials stick together and they are hard to break down. Um, but yeah, so you can just buy these and store them for as long as you need until you need to use them. And then Sarah uh, asks, do you have a good base glaze recipe you could share? Um, yeah, so it depends what 
type of glaze you want to make, um, if you go to glazy.org, um, so that is a glaze recipe sharing site um, where you can also like look at the chemistry of your glazes. You can substitute materials. It's a really great site. Um, and there's you can comment on recipes and ask people questions. Um, so if you go to glazy.org forward slash you for user forward slash Sue McLeod Ceramics, um, that is going to bring you to my Glazy account. And so I've posted all of our, the, the ceramic studio where I work, all of our studio glaze recipes are on there. Um, and then if you wanna base, Pardon me, if you want a base recipe that you can add colorants to, um, <clears throat> like it depends if you want a clear, like a transparent glaze or an opaque glaze. Um, but I did a workshop in Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada, um, a couple of years ago. And so what we did is we took 10 different glazes, um, so of our studio glazes, and we removed the colorants. So we mixed up the base glaze and then we added 10 different colorants. And all of those are also on my Glazy account. Um, so you can go through and you can see each base glaze with 10 different colorants and how they turn out. And so you could choose a base uh, glaze recipe from there. So there's lots of good, um, good glaze recipes on my account and they've all been used and used for years and tested and um, so they are good glazes to get you started. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> I will actually um, post the link to my glazy account. Let's see here. Um, because that'll just make it easier for you to find it. So I'm just going to post that in the comments. And <clears throat> pardon me. So just one second here. Um, okay, so I've posted my Glazy account in the comments. So you can check that out. Um, and just see if there's any other questions. So Oshan says, hi, Sue, can I mix stains as colorants to this base glaze recipe? Thank you so much. Yeah, so you can either use colorants <clears throat> like copper, iron, cobalt, nickel, manganese, uh, chrome. So those are all like the <clears throat> transition metals that are on the periodic table. Those are what we use to color our glazes, but you can also buy stains mason stains would be the stains that we would buy around here and those are manufactured colors so you can get um, a much wider range of colors if you're using stains um, rather than just the the raw oxides so um, when you use mason stains um, generally depending on the base recipe the color like what you see is what you get so if you you add a bright orange mason stain to a glaze you're going to get a bright orange glaze um whereas like copper and cobalt and iron are more subject to changing like the color response that you're going to get is going to be a little more dependent on the base recipe and so like cobalt for example you can get like bright navy blues and then you can also get like a more of a lavender purple color um, and copper you can get anywhere from greens to blues to turquoise um, and so i like to use the the oxides more than the stains like for my glazes because i just i like kind of the um like the natural not really sure what you're gonna get um uh, like the reaction from the natural oxides. But um, sometimes you just want a specific color if you're doing a commission or something where a customer wants you to match um, your glaze to their decor, then stains might be the way to go for that. Um, at the rec center where I work, we make our kids glazes with mason stains. So we have like a rainbow of colors. We have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Um, and so that 
is just nice for the kids to use so they can get the colors that they want. Um, let's see, reading the comments here. Sarah says, I had someone suggest mixing bentonite in water to make slip and let it sit before adding to the recipe. Do you agree? Can you explain why? Yeah, so I wrote an article about bentonite <clears throat> where I suggest doing the same thing. If you're, if the bentonite, or if you've already mixed your glaze with water, it can be really hard to introduce bentonite to an already mixed glaze because the bentonite will clump um, if you start mixing your glaze, try to mix the bentonite in, it really clumps together. Um, and even if you put it through a sieve, like those, um, those particles will find each other and clump back together. Um, so if you go to my website, uh, sumacloudceramics.com, and just search for an article on bentonite, um, then you'll find my recommendation for how to add bentonite to a wet glaze, which is, yes, where you add the bentonite to the water first. If you just let it slake down, um, then the particles all become wet and then they no longer will stick together and then you can add that to your recipe. But if you're just mixing a glaze from scratch with dry materials, then I would just add the bentonite in um, I would actually add the bentonite to the water first and then add all the rest of the glaze ingredients. Um, and so, uh, so you can just kind of add the bentonite the same way that you would add all the other materials. Um, Lynn says, how do you know if the amount of colorant is safe for functional wear? Are there published limits per colorant. Yeah, there isn't really like um, a steadfast rule about what is safe and what is not safe. Um, I would just like every every glaze recipe is different. And so it's really going to depend on the base recipe, um, whether the glaze is technically food safe or not. Um, so I mean, generally, if you have one or two percent of a colorant um, in a stable base recipe, uh, you should be totally fine. Um, it, it's that's a big conversation for um, for more of an expert on food safety than I am. Um, but I would say, like, if you're using a glaze that has up to three percent colorant. Um, like if it has more than 3%, then maybe you want to ask somebody um, that has a little more experience what they think and they can analyze the recipe and see if they think that um, it's a stable base recipe because you can make a stable glaze with high percentages of colorants in it. Um, the base recipe just has to reflect that. And um, so it's not like there's um, a limit, like you should never use more than 4% copper or something. Um, so yeah, so there's just like so many variables that I can't really answer that question. Um, but I would say like, if you have a stable base recipe, one to 2% colorant, um, that, that I would, that you should be fine. Um, but definitely if you have specific questions about specific glazes, then I would ask somebody that, um, has, that sort of experience, um, what they think about that. Um, Diana says, hopefully I'm getting all of these comments. Diana says, like Denise, I too am curious about what makes glazes matte or satin. Yeah, I mean, matte and satin, um, that all really depends on the chemistry of the base recipe. Um, and so, so you've got a matte, a matte glaze and a glossy glaze. Um, satin is kind of somewhere in between matte and glossy. And whether a glaze is going to be matte or glossy is generally dependent on the ratio of silica to alumina in a glaze formula. Um, so that gets into some like deeper chemistry. Um, but that's that would be my quick answer is that um, uh, it's the ratio of the materials. So silica to alumina ratio will often determine whether a glaze is matte 
or satin or glossy. Um, I have a blog post called How to Turn a Matte Glaze Glossy with One Ingredient. So if you want to go to my website and check that out, um, basically that article talks about how you can take um, a matte glaze with a specific composition and you can just add silica to it and uh, adding silica will turn a matte glaze glossy. Um, but it all, it depends on the matte glaze that you're starting out with, whether that will work, but that would be a good article for you to read just to kind of see how that works because I do explain a lot of the chemistry in that blog post. So that is called how to turn a matte glaze glossy with one ingredient. And that's on my website at sumacloudceramics.com. Okay, I'm going to finish reading this post, but please feel free to keep commenting and asking questions. Um, so other useful items for mixing glazes, personal protection equipment um, or PPE. Um, so I re also wrote an article called Safety in the Glaze Lab. Um, but when you're mixing glazes, you always want to have a half face respirator. Um, <clears throat> And so this is to protect your lungs because the materials we work with um, can be quite toxic if we inhale them. So silica, if we inhale silica into our lungs, which clay is made of silica, most of our glaze materials contain silica. Um, so we really want to protect our lungs from inhaling these powdered materials. Um, so <clears throat> I recommend getting a half face respirator with P100 cartridges. Um, that's the rating for the cartridges. Um, uh, an N95 mask would be like um, in a pinch. That could work, but I definitely, if you're going to be mixing glazes from scratch, I would want to get a, um, a full on half face respirator. And P100, um, it, P stands for particulate. And so they, the cartridges block 100% of the particulate in the atmosphere. So that's your best defense against the um, like the dusty materials that we are using to mix our glazes. Um, rubber gloves to protect your hands. So some of the materials can be absorbed into the skin and you wanna protect your skin from glaze materials, especially the colorants. Safety glasses. Um, I always wear safety glasses when I'm mixing glazes because um, when you're, you know, when you're dumping the materials into the bucket, sometimes the dust can come, um, make a big dust cloud and um, hit you in the face or like when you're mixing the glaze with the drill. So I always recommend high speed mixing. Um, and so I always tend to splash glaze everywhere when I'm doing that. So I always wear safety glasses. Um, so you don't want to get these materials in your eyes for sure. Um, and then an apron or a lab coat or coveralls I like to wear just to cover my, my whole outfit um, in case, especially the red glazes are all, you're always going to spill the red glaze all over your, your feet or your shoes or something. That's what I do. Um, yeah. So PPE. So just make sure that you're always conscious of your safety and the safety of others around you. So even if you're the only one mixing glazes, if there are other people in the room, they should also be wearing a respirator um, because the particulate can float around the air. Um, so I, yeah, I like to um, make sure that I am safe and everyone around me is safe as well. And then other tools and equipment that you might need for mixing glazes. An 80 mesh glaze sieve is what I use. Um, so I get that at my ceramic supplier. Um, so sieves, it's like a screen that you pour the glaze through and um, just to get rid of the lumps. Um, so sieves come in different mesh sizes. Um, 80 is kind of the standard. 60 mesh would have like larger openings. Um, and then 100 mesh or more would have would be a finer sieve. Um, if you're using um, red iron oxide, for example, um, can cause specking. And um, so if you have a glaze that uses iron and you're getting specking that you don't want, you might want to increase the mesh of your glaze sieve. So if you use 100 mesh, 120, even up to 200 mesh, 
Um, it's really, it's gonna take longer for you to get the glaze through the sieve, the, the finer the mesh that you're using, um, but that's gonna help break down the iron and reduce that specking. Um, a nylon bristle dish brush with handle for pushing your glaze through the sieve. Yeah, so it's just like, um, yeah, one of those dish brushes. So I pour the glaze into the sieve and then I use um, the, the dish brush to kind of um, uh, rub along the sieve to push the glaze through. And so you wanna use something that's soft, um, that's not going to damage your sieve. So a nylon bristle brush is good for that. Um, two to five gallon buckets with lids for storing your wet glazes. Um, so depending on the batch size you're making, um, generally most studio potters are going to, you know, make between two to five gallon bu uh, batch sizes. Um, but if you're, if you're in high production, you might even want larger buckets. Um, so at the studio where I work, uh, we have some of our glazes are like in big garbage cans. So depending on what you're making, just make sure you have buckets with lids um, that you can store your wet glazes in. And then you want to have sealable plastic containers to store your dry materials in. Um, and you want to make sure those are airtight in case you, you just wanna protect them from moisture in the atmosphere getting in um, and causing the materials to clump. Um, okay, back to the comments here. Uh, Denise says, thank you. Uh, Steve says, how can you tell if a glaze will, will crawl? Um, well, you can't always tell at first. Um, and if you're talking about crawling can be an effect that you, that you do on purpose, um, or it can be a flaw that you want to avoid. Um, so a good sign that your glaze might crawl is if after glazing, if you um, start noticing cracks in the surface of the glaze before you put the, the piece in the kiln, if the glaze starts cracking, that's a good sign that your glaze might crawl. Um, and crawling is where the glaze kind of peels away and exposes the clay body underneath. And that can happen if your glaze is too thick um, or if your uh, glaze contains too much water and there's too much shrinkage, um, when the glaze is drying, then that can lead to crawling. Um, what can you tell about copper oxide solubility for food safe glazes? Yeah, so I was just talking about um, uh, like oxides and food safety and how um, that's a really big topic and there isn't really um, an easy answer for that. Um, and so uh, I would just do some searching on the internet or you could even post into this Facebook group here. Um, and there are some people in this group that are much um, better experts on toxicity of glaze materials than I am, but it's always dependent on uh, the glaze recipe itself. So there isn't like a hard and fast rule about um, about the food safety with glazes. Um, Lynn asks, do you have to change glaze chemistry depending on whether you want to dip or brush on the glaze? Um, you don't have to really, it's not the chemistry, um, if you're thinking of like the recipe of the glaze, <clears throat> um, but it's more about the behavior of the glaze in the bucket. Um, so, and, and when the glaze uh, touches your bisque ware. So with a brushing glaze, you want um, the glaze to stay wet long enough for you to complete your brush stroke. So some glazes, as soon as you hit the brush to the bisque, the bisque absorbs all the moisture and then the glaze dries instantly. Um, so you don't get a nice fluid um, brush stroke with that type of glaze. So there are um, additives that you can add to a glaze to make it brushable. Um, CMC gum is one of those additives, although there are others. Um, and so CMC gum is, 
is something that um, it's like a, a slippery material. It's like a, a medium. So if you have ever painted, the, there's lots of all these different mediums you can add to your paint to change the way they apply to the canvas. Well, CMC gum is like a medium. So it, it makes the glaze more brushable, more fluid. So it stays wet longer as you're brushing it. Um, and um, it allows like the glaze to kind of settle out um, into an even layer before it starts to dry. Um, but basically dipping and brushing glazes um, can have the exact same recipe, um, but you just need to, um, like a brushing glaze might have a little bit less water in it than a dipping glaze, for example. You might want the brushing glaze a little bit thicker so you don't have to do so many coats in order to get um, a good result. Um, okay. Uh, any more comments, feel free. Um, and let's see if I missed anything. Doo -doo. Okay. Um, and now there was a, just a comment on my blog post itself that I wanted to answer. Okay. Um, it says uh, the commenter's name is uh, Loge, I think. I'm uh, probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but um, dear Sue, what is your reasoning for the Nephilim cyanite? Why not just stick with Custer? Um, so I was explaining earlier, Nephilim cyanite is like a feldspar. It's not exactly a feldspar. So a feldspar generally contains one fluxing molecule, uh, one aluminum molecule, molecule, and then six silica molecules. And so that's kind of like the generic composition for a feldspar. Uh, whereas Nephilim cyanite, it has the proportion of fluxing molecules to glass forming molecules is higher. So, you know, for gram for gram, Nephsi is going to have more flux and less silica than um, a feldspar. So Custer, was uh, the, in the question. So Custer is a potassium feldspar um, and potassium has a bit of a higher melting point than sodium. Um, so you can have soda, sodium feldspars, you can have potassium feldspars. They do the same thing, but potassium is just a bit of a higher temperature. Uh, it melts at a bit of a higher temperature than sodium. And then Nephsi contains both sodium and potassium, um, and it has more fluxing molecules like per gram than um, feldspar. So that's why I use Nephsi. Also, Nephsi is um, mined in Canada, so it might be cheaper for me to get Nephsi because it's um, one of the cheaper materials. And so working at cone six, um, we want as much flux as we can get because we want to bring that melting temperature down. Um, so the feldspars um, generally get used in the higher temperature recipes um, because they, they just melt at a higher temperature, whereas Nefsi just melts at a bit of a lower temperature. And then he says, same with talc and meg carb. So I didn't include magnesium carbonate um, in my list, I don't think. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so talc is magnesium silicate. Magnesium carbonate is another material that doesn't contain silica, um, but magnesium carbonate is this really fluffy, light, um, low density material that unless you're making crawl glazes on purpose, um, magnesium carbonate is is one of the materials that I use to make crawl glazes on purpose. So like glazes with kind of a cracked texture. Um, but as a main base ingredient, magnesium carbonate is um, can cause crawling when you don't want it to happen. And so um, talc, if you're if your glaze um, so they're both sources of magnesium, but talc is just um, a nicer material, I guess, to work with where it, 
it's not as light and fluffy and um, absorbing of all the moisture in the glaze. Um, but then talc also adds silica to your recipe. So if you want magnesium with no added silica, then mag carb might be the way that you go. And then there's dolomite as well, um, which is dolomite contains magnesium and calcium. And so talc, dolomite, and magnesium carbonate are all materials that will provide your glaze with magnesium, but talc contains the addition of silica, and then dolomite contains the addition of calcium. So all of these things are going to affect the texture of your glaze, um, possibly the color, possibly the glossiness or matteness of the glaze. Um, so I just didn't put mag carb on the list because it's a it's a really finicky material um, and I tend to avoid it unless I'm using it on purpose to make a crawl glaze. Um, and so let's see, what was his other question? Oh, he also says anyone in Europe would of course substitute with cheaper local materials. Yes, Ulexite, uh, Portabore, instead of grossly borate. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, I mentioned that earlier that these materials are readily available to me where I live in Canada. And so if you live somewhere else in the world, um, please post your questions about what you could substitute for these materials in the Facebook group. And then someone else I'm sure can help you with that because I'm not really sure what's available and not available um, in other countries. Okay, so let's see here. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, back to the comments. Okay. Um, Steve says, are the metal marks on some glaze surfaces coursed from dolomite in the glaze recipe? Ca oh, maybe caused by dolomite? Um, metal marking, my understanding is metal marking is from, uh, if your glaze has a rough texture um, and your glaze is harder than your utensil, um, then part of um, bits of your utensil, if the, if the metal is softer than the glaze, and glazes tend to be really hard, um, like silica is a very hard, uh, makes a very hard glass. And so if you have a, t um, a matte glaze or a glaze with texture, and then you rub your metal utensil onto that, then some of the utensil, because the, ten the utensil is softer, a softer material than the glaze, then some of that is going to wear off on your glaze surface. Now, more expensive cutlery is going to give less metal marking than cheaper cutlery. Um, so that's something, but I wouldn't say that it has to do with dolomite, although oftentimes you get matte glazes that are made with dolomite. So that might be where you're associating dolomite with cutlery marking um, because yeah, matte glazes are more prone to cutlery marking because of um, it just doesn't have that glossy texture. Um, and so generally glossy glazes are, are more resistant to cutlery marking. And so I would use, tend to use a glossy glaze on any surfaces that are going to be come in contact with cutlery, um, if that's something that you want to avoid. Um, okay, let's see here. Comments, it's not letting me see all the comments. Um, wait, maybe I can see them over here. Doo -doo -doo. Um, <clears throat> Can you comment on how to determine what temperature homegrown glazes should be fired to? Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's like a big class <laughs> um, that I do intend on teaching this year at some point. Um, so, I mean, at this point, the quick answer, and I think you said it might be out of scope. So it's a little out of scope for today, but 
Um, the quick answer is just to base the temperature on the published glaze recipe. Um, so if you go to glazy.org, all the recipes are gonna say what temperature they are fired to. Um, the more you learn about chemistry and um, start looking at your glaze recipes and the UMF, the unity molecular formula of your recipes, um, you'll start to understand and see patterns for, oh, like I can look at a glaze recipe and say, that seems like it's probably a cone 10 recipe based on the materials. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little, a little more involved than what I can comment on here. Um, there are ways, you know, like to make an educated guess, but really the only true way to know by looking at a recipe is to stick it in the kiln and fire it. Um, yeah, so sorry, I, I don't, I can't really um, answer that question completely, but um, yeah, there are ways like, um, for example, a glaze, you know, with a lower silica and alumina content is going to melt at a lower temperature than a glaze with really high silica and alumina. And a glaze that um, contains no boron, so boron is a low temperature glass former, um, so it's gonna bring down the melting temperature of the glaze. So a glaze that contains no boron um, is probably a higher temperature glaze because I know boron will bring that melting temperature down. And so those are like a few things to look for. So if there's no boron in a glaze recipe, um, there's a good chance that it's um, higher than a cone six, like maybe a cone 10 recipe. But again, it's there's not really um, like a definitive way um, to, to figure that out without testing. Um, okay, on average, uh, okay, sorry, it's not showing me your names on this comment thread, um, so, but I'm just going to read the comments. Um, on average, how many grams of dry ingredients go into two gallons, five gallons, etc.? Thank you very much for sharing your glaze wisdom. Um, so let's see here. If I was making a 2000 gram batch of dry glaze, um, I would say that would fit into a two gallon bucket for sure. Um, like at, even with the water added, um, yeah, I'm just thinking a five gallon bucket. Yeah. So if say, if you have a two gallon bucket, um, that could definitely fit 2,000 grams and a five gallon bucket would fit 5,000 grams and probably even more than that. Um, I would say a five gallon bucket, you could probably fit up to 8,000 grams and it's going to depend on the glaze recipe because some materials are more dense than others and some are more fluffy. Like if you had a glaze recipe that was all magnesium carbonate, you'd need a much bigger bucket than a glaze recipe without. Um, but yeah, generally I would say if you are making 2000 grams and you have a two gallon bucket, then that's going to fit um, if that's what you're questioned about. Um, <clears throat> how low does magnesium need to be in a glaze to stop crawling? I mean, you can make a glaze that doesn't crawl with magnesium in it. Um, it just depends on the source of magnesium. So if you have a glaze that's crawling and it contains magnesium carbonate, you want to, you might want to make a substitution where you are removing some of the magnesium carbonate and adding in talc or dolomite instead. Um, but you can have a, like I've used a glaze that has like 5% magnesium carbonate in it and it doesn't crawl because it's such a small percentage. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, but there are other ways to prevent crawling as well. Um, crawling can happen uh, due to high clay content. As we know, clay shrinks when it dries. So clay in a glaze recipe is also going to shrink as the glaze is drying. So if you have a lot of clay in your glaze recipe, 
Um, as the water evaporates, the particles move closer together. Um, if it shrinks too much over that piece of bisque that is um, stationary, and then the glaze is shrinking around it, then that can cause, cause cracking and then crawling during the firing. Um, and so with a glaze um, that's crawling because of high clay content, as opposed to magnesium, um, you could deflocculate that glaze and that would help to prevent the crawling. Um, and so with the, with your question about magnesium, like if I saw the recipe, um, if it had 30% magnesium carbonate, then I would, I would say, yeah, there's a good chance this glaze is gonna crawl no matter what. And um, I would either find a new recipe or try to substitute um, either talc or dolomite um, which is going to change the appearance of the glaze in the long run, but um, it depends. Like, do you want the crawling, or do you want you want to keep the glaze the same and deal with the crawling? Um, so there's so many different ways to solve uh, glaze issues. Um, can I store dry materials in a shed that freezes? Yeah, um, no problem. Uh, the dry materials um, shouldn't be affected by freezing. It's um, just if there's moisture in there and then the moisture starts freezing. Um, but I've never had an issue. Um, I mean, I live in Canada, but I live in like the hottest part of Canada on Vancouver Island. So we don't drop below freezing very often, maybe a few weeks of the year. Um, and so I haven't really had to deal with like, super um, cold temperatures. So maybe if somebody has experience with that, they could comment on that. Um, but I don't see any reason why the dry materials would um, have any issues in freezing temperatures. Um, for tools and equipment, should we get a scale for weighing materials? Yeah, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't, I didn't even put, nope. I forgot to put a scale. I wrote this blog post like five years ago. Um, yeah, no, very good point. Yes, you definitely need a scale for weighing your glaze materials. Um, scales come in different, um, so scales have a capacity, which is like the maximum amount that they can weigh. Um, so you can get scales with different capacities. So you can get a scale that weighs up to 500 grams or a scale that weighs up to 50 kilograms. Um, and then readability of a scale is um, like how accurate it is, basically like how many decimal points um, the scale will measure. So you can have a scale with a readability of one gram, which means um, the scale measures in one gram increments. And so you wouldn't be able to uh, weigh half a gram accurately on a scale that has a readability of one gram. And so you'd want, um, so for very small material, um, small amounts, like for the colorants and everything, I would definitely have a scale that will, has a readability of a tenth of a gram um, uh, so that you can be really accurate with your ingredient measurements. Because especially if you're making glaze tests, people are, are always saying, you know, I made a, a test glaze and it looked amazing. And then I made a large bucket and it looks completely different. And that's often has to do with the accuracy um, of your scale. And if you're making a very small batch, um, a very small margin of error, once you multiply that into a large batch, um, that can be make a big difference in the final result. So um, I have two scales. I have one with a readability of one gram and it weighs up to five kilograms. And then I have one, um, I have a triple beam balance scale that will give me that 10th of a gram. And so I use that when I'm measuring colorants or when I'm doing small glaze tests, like um, anything under 500 gram batch of glaze, I'm gonna weigh my materials with that triple beam balance scale um, because of the accuracy where I can see if I'm like just over a gram um, you can also get digital scales that have, um, you know, that are more precise and that go to a tenth of a gram or even two decimal 
places. So a hundredth of a gram. Um, I just haven't uh, I haven't upgraded from my triple beam balance scale yet to a digital version. Um, but yeah, you can definitely have a digital scale that will do that as well. So I need to update this post and add um, a scale to the other useful items section. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, I can't see your names. Um, this app that I'm using to record this live, um, it doesn't show me uh, your names. I'm going to be mixing my very first glaze. I found it on glazy.org. The base recipe is this. Can you tell by looking at a recipe if that seems like it will be a good glaze? Um, I So I can't tell by looking at a recipe. Um, I generally would look at the UMF of a glaze. So if you go to glazy.org, you got your recipe, which gives you the amount of the materials, but then it also breaks it down into the unity molecular formula, which breaks down all those materials in the recipe into their, um, into their oxides. So we've got um, silica, alumina, boron. So those are all glass formers. Um, and then we've got sodium, potassium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, strontium, barium, and zinc. Those are all the fluxes. And so it shows me the proportions of the glass formers to the fluxes and the proportions of the primary fluxes to the secondary fluxes. And so looking at that, because um, Looking at a glaze recipe, you've got nephsi, which contains sodium, potassium, silica, and alumina. And then you've got ferrofrit 3134, which also contains um, sodium, silica, alumina, boron. Um, so you've got these materials that contain all these various oxides, and then you lump them all together, and they all combine. Um, and so you've got silica. Um, that's coming from your pure silica, but you've also got silica in your nephsa, you've got silica in your frit. Um, and so looking at a recipe by itself doesn't give me the information that I need to really see what's going on with the glaze. I would need to look at the unity molecular formula. Now, based on this recipe, um, I can tell that it it contains ferrofrit 3134, which, I know is a source of boron. And so that tells me, okay, this is possibly a cone six glaze um, or lower temperature glaze because it does contain some boron. So if the recipe didn't contain any boron, I would be skeptical as to whether it was a, um, it was a cone six glaze. Um, but that is basically the extent of what I can tell just from looking at a recipe without looking at the chemistry as well. <clears throat> uh, can you recommend a good glaze chemistry book? Um, yeah, the the main book that I would recommend, um, oh, it's not in here. Um, Clay and Glazes for the Potter is one by Daniel Rhodes. Um, so that's a good uh, book that gets into the chemistry. Um, uh, Val Cushing's Handbook um, is another one. Um, that gets into the chemistry. Um, I forget what it's, it's, it's orange. Um, it's like an orange spiral bound book, um, but it's got, it's chock full of information. So I think it's called Cushing's Handbook. Um, uh, I also have the Ceramic Spectrum by Robin Hopper. Um, let me think. I, yeah, I didn't really, um, do much, most of my learning through books, um, but I do have a collection of glaze books. Um, so those are some of the books that I have in my glaze library. Um, flint for silica and china clay for kaolin in the UK. Yeah, flint and silica and quartz um, kind of all mean the same thing. So they all... Um, they generally refer to silica as a material. And so your 
<clears throat> ceramic supplier might call it flint or silica or quartz. Um, if you're in glazy.org, um, you can see that flint, silica, and quartz, um, they all have the same composition. So they're all part of the same material in the glaze calculator. Um, and then UK potash feldspar for custer. Yeah, so custer is a brand name for potassium feldspar. Potash is another way of saying potassium. Um, so custer, um, mahavir is another um, potash or potassium feldspar. Uh, G200 is another potassium feldspar. So you've got your potassium feldspar, the generic material, and then there's different mining companies that um, distribute it under different names. So Custer is a brand name, G200 is a brand name, uh, Mahavir is a brand name. So, um, but they all talk, they all are referring to potash or potassium feldspar. And generally the potassium feldspars, one can be substituted for another uh, without a huge difference in the chemistry. Um, what are frits and their different characteristics? So <clears throat> frits are just glazes um, that were manufactured in a lab. Um, they've been so they are manufactured to contain a specific composition um, and then they've been melted into glass and then, um, and then ground down into a powder. So they've already gone through the melting process once. Um, so all like the chemical reactions have kind of already taken place. Um, and so then they're ground into a powder. So you're basically just adding a powdered glaze composition to your glaze. So you can, um, uh, like a frit is just a glaze in itself with a specific composition. They're not all gonna melt at the same temperature, um, but it's a way that um, it's kind of, uh, it's like mason stains compared to the colorant oxides. Um, it's already been manufactured, which makes it a little more expensive uh, because of the processing that goes into it. Um, but it's more predictable in its results um, because you don't have these raw earthen materials. They've already been, um, they've already gone through their chemical conversions in the kiln. And so um, then you're just adding them to your glaze. So a lot of the commercial ceramic companies are going to use frits rather than um, feldspars and girthly borate and, um, you know, EPK, like all these um, earthen, like raw materials. Um, they're going to use frits because they um, are just more predictable. They have a specific composition and they've been tested and everything. And so they're going to get the predictability of the glazes that they're looking for. Um, someone says freezing clay is a problem though. Yes, freezing clay is a problem. That's because um, clay it contains water and then the water freezes and then that can cause issues with your clay. Um, it requires um, a lot of, so if your clay has frozen, it requires a lot of mixing uh, to get it back into a good working consistency. Um, I have, Someone says, I have stored dry materials in Michigan, frozen winters without problem. Perfect. Um, okay, Sylvia says, substituting fritz, big question for potters outside North America. Is there a recipe we can use instead of a frit or is it always necessary to reformulate the entire glaze recipe? Yeah, so you can take, um, so a frit, so frit 3124, for example which is on my list, my shopping list, um, that frit contains sodium, um, sodium, calcium, silica, alumina, and boron. And so you can, you can create um, a glaze that contains frit 3124 with other materials, other sources of sodium, calcium, silica, alumina, and boron. So you can 
basically create the same recipe using different materials as long as the chemistry, the unity molecular formula is the same. Now the appearance of the fired glaze might be slightly different because frits are manufactured, um, whereas the raw materials, like the frit basically, when it reaches its melting point, it just melts. Whereas um, the raw materials like the, Nefsi might start melting first and you know like the different materials are going to start melting at different times and then that can kind of affect the way the glaze looks um, in the long run. So you can substitute different sources of all the oxides that are in that frit using other materials or you could even substitute frits for each other but generally you're going to have to add in other materials or remove other materials from the recipe in order to get the UMF to match. Um, yeah, Fritz are, Ricky says, Fritz are easily available in Europe. Um, uh, yeah, so, they, so there are different companies that make different types of Fritz around the world. And so the Fritz that you can get in Europe might have different numbers um, or be called different things, um, but basically the composition is going to be consistent. And so I'm sure there's like um, a substitute for, you know, the North American Fritz um, in Europe where they, they have similar compositions. Uh, Ricky says, John Britt's books are very good. Yeah, John Britt has um, uh, the... Midfire, I forget what it's called, exploring mid range glazes, I think. And then he has a high fire uh, glaze book as well. Um, yeah, so those are super popular books. Um, Iris says, Yes, I have Val Cushing's. Okay, I think I answered all the questions. Um, thank you all for joining me. Um, this is the most people I've had on this ceramic story time. There's 45 people <laughs> watching right now. So this is awesome. Um, I'm really happy to have you here. I'm just going to hide my uh, blog post here. So yeah, again, um, uh, check out my website. Um, there's articles you know, different articles for the subjects that people have brought up today, like bentonite or um, matte versus glossy glazes. So sumacloudceramics.com. Um, I have written lots of articles. If you have any suggestions for things that you'd like me to write about, um, I'm going to be um, start blogging again this year. So I'm really excited about that. And um, the way I decide what to write about is from the questions that I get from people. And when I hear the same question over and over again, um, then I'll generally write an article um, to answer that for everybody. So thank you all for coming and joining me here live on Facebook. Um, and this video will be posted um, on the, my blog. Um, it'll be attached to this blog post. Um, so if you go to bit.ly forward slash glaze shopping list, that'll take you to the post that I read today. Um, and then you can watch the video if you want to watch it back and see all the answers to all these questions. Um, and um, there's also going to be a, an audio file through SoundCloud. So if you'd like to like listen to podcasts while you're walking or something, you can just listen to that, uh, to this as well. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for saying thank you. And I hope you have a great day. And I will see you next week with another story time. So, bye. <laughs>